I need a microphone because I've got this quiet voice, you see. Nobody can hear me. Right, uh, I had no idea when I came here it was going to be a session with an audience and a, and a, a panel, but there you go. Um, it's great to be here. I'm having a great time. I'm being well looked after, especially by this man. And uh, uh, that was a fantastic song, wasn't it? I'm going to learn that song. That song is going to be sung in England very soon when I get back. Um, what can I tell you? Right, um, I'm a little bit different category from, from a lot of the lads, call them lads, because they're a lot younger than me, in, in Veterans for Peace, because uh, 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 as men will probably tell you, they went back to Downing Street recently and th threw back their medals and their uh, documents and their berries and that, and uh, that was a very effective demonstration, and lots of people want to do that. Um, I'm thrown by my medals because um, I'm not a pacifist. I'm a firm believer in people's right to defend themselves from attack. So if any one of you wants to come up and punch me, you get punched back. Because <laughs> I, I, I believe in self-defense, and I believe in the right of people uh, to liberate themselves from oppression, as you did. It's been referred to, you know, people should not be subjugated, should not be subject to uh, uh, oppression and exploitation, and they should not be attacked. So I, I'm not the least bit ashamed that I fought against the evil of Nazi tyranny, because if we hadn't won that war, hadn't fought and won that war, the whole of Europe and possibly eventually America would have been enslaved for generations to a, a monstrous tyranny and evil and evil ideology. So, but that was almost just about the last just war. There's a thing about war, people get a taste for it. And Britain did, Britain has, has done its share of oppression and exploitation. We were a colonial power. We have a lot to be ashamed of in our past. And now you've got a lot to be ashamed of as well. You bloody well ought to be ashamed of Vietnam. You ought to be ashamed of a lot of things you've done. And w while uh, uh, th th I said that was a great song he, uh, that Ross sang, and it's right, and it does protect people in America and Britain, but your country is denying that right to lots of people. There are people, there's a British, is a, is a nation, you know. So they don't have the same rights for some reason. This guy's a Muslim. But but he's been incarcerated in Guant Guantanamo Bay for a decade. He's never been charged with any offence. Never been charged. And we say, we don't know if he'd ever did anything bad. Take him to a bloody court and investigate and interrogate him and find out. Let's, ha let's find out. But you can't just lock people up because you think that they might have committed an offence. And you're doing that. And you certainly can't, shouldn't torture them. And I'll tell you this. I talked and met with some some brave young Americans in 1944, shortly before they went and were killed on the beach at Omaha. And I, if I had had, I don't believe in psychic phenomena, but if I'd had the psychic ability, and if I'd talked to those young Americans, those brave young Americans in 1944, before they went to their deaths, and if I'd said, do you know, in 70 years time, your country will be doing what the Nazis are doing. They'll be torturing people. They'll be locking people up without trial. They'll be wiping out villages in retirement. They'll be doing all the things that we're fighting against now. They would have punched me, wouldn't they? They would have said, you're a bloody stupid communist liar, and they'd have punched me in the face and, and gone about their business. But that's where we are. You know, they'd be, if they knew, they'd turn in their graves. So, Sorry, I shouldn't be, shouldn't be lecturing you about, <laughs> about the evening. You all know about what's wrong with your government, just as we know what's wrong with our government. <laughs> and they're both in cahoots and, and make, making the same mistakes over and over again. Right, so how did I come to be anti-war, having been plunged into a war at the age of 15, which I thought was necessary and which I'm not ashamed of having been involved in. But after the war, I saw 
at a very early age, the horror of war. I saw more dead men in my first year after leaving school than I've seen since. And I saw lots of terrible things happen. And so I'm, I was aware of, the, after, the, after the war finished, I went into the Royal Navy. I was a merchant seaman at the end of the war. I went into the Royal Navy and I was a radar operator. And I quite enjoyed my time in the Navy because I went all around the world and I saw lots of places. I came to America. But I also thought and educated myself. I did a lot of reading. And I was a radar operator. And I remember very well when the British built the last battleship that we ever built was after the war. It was, a, it was the HMS Vanguard. And it was state of the art. You've probably got things bigger and better now, but it was a state of the art weapon of mass destruction. It could throw. Shell, 16 inch shells, 30 miles. And he had the radar, while I went on board and checked, because he had what they call stag mounting. Stag mounting was, they could switch the guns, these 16 inch guns, to radar control. The radar would pick up things over the horizon, because he could bounce, that's a technique to, to bounce. Take up a target, tell the guns, the gu uh, we know the gun layer was redundant. The, the radar equipment, I don't know how it worked, but I can't remember how it worked. I was supposed to learn. Would train the guns on that target and it would all be done with uh, electronics and all kinds of gizmos that I, I, I can't remember or, or didn't really master them. But, but I remember being enormously impressed by the amount of skill and science and, and, and thought and effort had gone into this. And I remember that, and th this ship was swarming with boffins and scientists. And they'd worked for years to perfect this, just as they'd worked for years to perfect the uh, atomic bomb and all the other uh, fantastic new weapons of war, that, that many of which were seen for the first time on D-Day. And, and it occurred to me, I thought, if only a fraction of that skill and that energy and that determination that had gone into perfecting these weapons of mass, these, uh, the ability to kill people at long if only a fraction of that effort and skill and money had been put into thinking how they didn't need to kill people at long distance, how they could avoid the necessity of killing people at long distance, they did, you know, to avoid the conflict in the first place. It was bound to succeed, wasn't it? It must, it must work. You know, I'm sure we've all been in a situation where you know, there's a conflict. Negotiation can avoid conflict. Discussion, compromise, recognition of differences. Some cases saying, all right, well, you're entitled to walk away from things. So many fights can be avoided. I used to get into a lot of fights when I was a kid. And the reason I got into lots of fights was because I was terribly afraid that somebody else would think I was a coward. And because I was a coward, or I thought I, thought I was a coward, and I, I didn't want anybody else to know, so I used to walk up to people who I thought were looking at me funny and say, what are you looking at? <laughs> I, would, I would pick fights with people to prove to myself that I wasn't afraid of them. And I think there's an element of that. And once I got over that and realized that, you know, that I didn't have to prove that to myself, I, I, I would do, once I found that I could do whatever I needed to do to, to survive and to maintain my self-respect. I didn't need to pick fights anymore and I stopped doing it. And, and, and it's time your country and my country stopped doing it because they're still bloody well doing it to, to demonstrate. They still want to be the big boys on the block. All right, have I said enough? Do you want to... Uh, I've got to do a song. Uh, Ross has told me, I, I, as you know, I, I'm into folk singing. I've sung a few songs and I've become fairly I'm reasonably well known on the folk circuit in Britain. I, I'm not, as, as uh, Bob Shane said, the best known folk singer in Britain. Uh, but, but I am reasonably well known, especially on the shanty circuit, because I know a lot of sea songs. And last year I was shot to prominence because the BBC suddenly discovered, discovered me and uh, I got two gigs at the Royal Albert Hall, which is every folk singer's dream to sing in the Royal Albert Hall, just as here it would be Carnegie Hall. And uh, even to sing in front of the Queen. Wow. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm not a royalist. Anyway, 
Um, so I was the song that uh, catapulted me into prominence was the f very first song I ever wrote, actually, years ago. After I didn't go back to Normandy for 20, 25 years after the war. And by the time I went back, I thought, you know, I'm, I've got this all under control. And, but when I did go back and saw the beach with children playing on the beach that I'd last seen as a scene of death and destruction, I was very moved and I wept a it. I remember I wept. Uh, lots of veterans wept when they go back. And uh, I decided there and then I was going to record my, my story of that and my feelings about that. So this is a straightforward, I wrote the song, straightforward account of that day from my point of view as a 15 year old galley boy. And somehow or other, it struck a chord with people and I'm gonna sing it for you. Uh, it's not particularly an anti-war song, but it's certainly not a pro-war song. It's a tribute song. And it goes like this. It's called The Shores of Normandy. And if you want to hear it with a BBC concert orchestra, just Google my name and it comes up at the Royal Albert Hall. Gorgeous accompaniment, by the way. Absolutely a magical recording. Pardon? It's at, at the Royal Albert Hall, accompanied by the London Symphony Orchestra. It doesn't get better. Yeah. So this is unaccompanied, as I normally sing. Right? <laughs> uh, And the cold gray light of the 6th of June in the year of 44. The Empire Lot sailed out from Poole to join with thousands more. The largest fleet the world had seen we sailed in close array and we set our course for Normandy at the dawning of the day. There was not one man in all our crew but knew what lay in store. For we had waited for that day through five long years of war we knew that many would not return but all our hearts were true for we were bound for Normandy where we had a job to do now the Empire Larch was a deep sea tug with a crew of 33 and I was just the galley boy on my first trip to sea. I little thought when I left home of the dreadful sights I'd see. But I came to manhood on the day that I first saw Normandy. At Aramanche off the beach of gold Neath the rocket's deadly glare We towed our block ships into place And we built a harbour there Mid shot and shell we built it well As history does agree While brave men died in the swirling tide On the shores of Normandy like the Rodney and the Nelson, there were ships of great renown. But rescue tugs all did their share, as many a ship went down. We ran our pontoons to the shore, within the Mulberry's lee. And we made safe berth for the tanks and guns that would set all Europe free. But for every hero's name that's known, a thousand died as well. On stakes and wires their bodies hung, rocked in the ocean swell. And many a mother wept that day, for the sons they loved so well. Men had cracked the joke, and cats the smoke, 
as they storm the gates of hell. As the years pass by, I can still recall the men I saw that day who died upon that blood-soaked sand where now sweet children play and those of you who were unborn who've lived in liberty remember those who made it so on the shores of Normandy there you go